Sonic Academy course of my Dead Mouse remix is out now. In your most recent productions, what do you use the LFOs most frequently slash mainly for? Uh, P.S. Good to know there are fellow Julia QV fans in this community. Saddened to hear of the passing of the mighty Andrew Weatherall. Tips on how to achieve a full and wide mix. How do you copyright your compositions? How do you manage to keep your production techniques to the essential? Can you recommend an alternative to the L1 or L2? Any progress on the new studio? I feel like any time I'm not making music, I'm wasting my time. I don't want to be the one saying this, but I feel like I need to maybe be the one saying this. Hey guys and welcome to the Kane Audio vlog. It's Friday, it's time for another Ask Me Anything. Usual rules apply. Comment anything you want below this video and I'll get back to you in next week's video. Uh, before I look at last week's video, is there any house admin? What have I been doing this week? I have, dare I say it, I think maybe finished the final draft version of my album. I've got a title. I've got a little narrative booklet. I have 10 tracks. I didn't go with 12 in the end. I, I finished the 10th and it told the story I needed to tell. I've got, I don't know if I said title, yeah, everything's kind of in place now. I've got an idea for artwork and uh, I am talking to an artist in getting that artwork done at the minute. Scary, scary, scary times. I've only been producing 25 years and this is my first artist album. So uh, yeah, there we go. What else have I been doing this week? I cannot think, to be honest with you. Um, I'm looking at... Oh, that's what I did make a note of. Um, I guess most of you already know, but the Sonic Academy course of my Dead Mouse remix is out now. Uh, so if anybody uh, wants to know how I did my remix of Dead Mouse Caritas, uh, I have done quite literally a step-by-step -step process in recreating that remix from start to finish and I sort of cover uh, everything from from how I kind of approached it with it being a, a fluid BPM and all sorts of weird quirks in there um, and how I sort of made that fit a tempo that because if I remember rightly it was like 45 BPM or something Clearly my remix wasn't 45 BPM, so I sort of cover all of that. Um, and then obviously building drums, getting a decent groove, making the bass line fit, doing the breakdown, doing the arrangement. Uh, yeah, it's all in there. Uh, so yeah, check that out. Uh, for any of you guys that are already members of Sonic Academy, then it's there in your account, ready and waiting. Uh, if you're not a member of Sonic Academy, to be honest, I highly recommend it. Uh, this is one of the reasons why I continually do these courses for Sonic Academy. Um, I think it's a, a, a great place to be. It's got a brilliant forum. It's got helpful members. Um, it's clearly got helpful tutors um, and it's just full of useful stuff. Uh, and of course, they do some great plugins on top. So there's just no reason not to be a member. Uh, I think that is it for House Admin this week. I I want to update my Spotify playlist, but I haven't quite added enough new music to it to refresh it yet. I aim for about two hours, basically. And what I do is I tend to have listening sessions where I'm listening to new music or, or sometimes old music. And uh I sort of aim for a playlist of about two hours and then go, right, that's the one update. Um, 
at the moment I'm at about an hour, an hour and a quarter, so I'm not quite there yet. So hopefully next week I will have an updated Spotify playlist. And that, my friends, is it. Uh, right, on with the show. Let's have a look. Starting at the top, Cavacade. Uh, skill and downforce. High five and high five. Uh, late comment this week. The storm took out our internet. Mm. Uh, back online today, Thursday, in the nick of time. Edit. Apparently it wasn't in the nick of time, so I just copied over the comment from last week. I apologise, I didn't see your comment last week. That's weird, actually. And I've literally just, before I... Because I did see this comment come through during the week, uh, I then... Just before I started recording this, I went to the comments likely held for review or likely spam or whatever, and there's nothing in there either. So uh, maybe I just missed it. So I apologise for that. Anyway, uh, no question this week, but I have an idea for episode 100. What about a live stream AMA? With enough notice, I'm sure a few of us could make it. Yes and no. <clears throat> Um, I have thought about doing a live stream. There are a couple of issues with that. First of all, I am using a DSLR camera, which doesn't allow me to do live streams. Um, that's not a major issue. I do have a webcam in a box somewhere, and that's got a built-in webcam. Um, I've got another camera I don't think that does it either but whatever I, I do have cameras and the ability and obviously a phone so I could do a live stream uh, however aside from the the technological side uh, and the other thing of course is don't forget with a live stream is it's much lower resolution and and lower quality audio and whatever as well usually um, so so actually what we're doing is we're, we're downgrading the video and I kind of felt like, you know, these videos don't, you know, I don't have a massive following. Um, and is it worth going live and downgrading the video quality for everyone on the basis that a few people might watch live? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, although I do like the idea of the, the, the maybe we get more of a back and forth questioning. Uh, it's something I'm figuring out, basically. I don't... Uh, uh, short answer is I don't think I'm going to be able to do it for the 100th episode. But I do plan on getting this garden studio done by the summer, or in the summer, maybe. Uh, so we're talking a few months' time. And I'm hoping, because I will be laying down um, gigabit Ethernet cables to that as well so hopefully I'll be able to do live streams from there um, because that place is going to be kind of set up for it I hope anyway that's the plan uh, we'll see anyway uh, so with enough notice I'm, I'm sure a few of us could make it y yes I look I'm going to carry on considering it I, I honestly I don't know if I don't know how the I mean the thing is with this format um, of these AMAs I, this is like the the anti YouTube video. So I, I can appreciate that, you know, those of you who do watch this, thank you very much for putting up with me being boring and not Mr. Beast. Um, you know, the format is, is quite dry. And I think, unfortunately, because of that, as much as I'd love to do something special for a hundredth episode, I'm also very aware that the format's kind of boring. So really what, what can I, it like, it doesn't, it's not open, is it? Anyway, uh, P.S. Good to know there are fellow Julia QV fans in this community. Damn right. Uh, I've been lusting that car since it was announced. Me too. Uh, it is honestly my dream car. I don't know if I've, I've probably mentioned it before, but yeah, honestly, I've, I've said, you know, if I became a multi-millionaire lottery winner, whatever, um, the Julia would be the first car I would buy. I mean, it's not even unobtainable now. Um it's not a crazy supercar in terms of price second hand i think they're about 30k which is uh, i can't afford that for a car but um <clears throat> but it's not that too far away so uh i'm just waiting for the uh the prices to come down but um yeah i've always said if i won the lottery that that would be the first car 
I order yeah, absolutely 100%. Um, I, I think in terms of actual supercars, I'd probably have one, which is the Ferrari F12 TDF, uh, because it's an absolute monster. Uh, if not that, maybe the GTC4 Lusso, uh, because it's a bit more family orientated. But anyway, a V12 engine just for the sound, and as a sound engineer, sound designer, the V12 engine, especially when it's got a, a straight pipe exhaust, is just the most beautiful, albeit uh, obnoxious sound on earth. Uh, I'm sure my neighbours would hate me. Um, but then again, I'm sure they probably already hate me with my current car. Uh, I saw a brand new one on a trailer last year that the owner had wrapped around a tree. Oh, she was fine, which speaks volumes for the car's safety, but I could have cried seeing such a beautiful machine in that state. The yeah, if it was the Quadrifoglio Verde uh, model, then uh, I'm not surprised it was wrapped around a tree, to be honest. Those things are, uh, you know, they're rear-wheeled, 510 brake horsepower. Uh, they're quite arse-happy. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm not surprised, if I'm honest. Uh, that I, I genuinely, as much as I, as much as I, dream of owning a uh, Julia QV. I also cack myself uh, in knowing that they're rear end happy um, and I've watched enough car videos and whatever to see people sort of losing the back end um, and I know they come with the uh, um, uh, the they're not the coarser tyres the whatever tyres they come with I'm sure they are P0, but whatever. Uh, slippy is what I'm trying to say. Uh, anyway, this is not a car channel. This is a music channel, and I digress. Andrew Hollis, skill, high five. Uh, saddened to hear of the passing of the mighty Andrew Weatherall. Uh, what is your favourite body of work from his vast catalogue, and did you ever cross paths when DJing? If so, any interesting tales? Uh, yeah, first of all, honestly, my heartfelt sympathies to his family and friends um i didn't know him on a personal level we had crossed paths uh, a couple of times when i was in space in ibiza uh but i never spoke to him in any depth other than all right um but because obviously i was kind of in and out of those circles of people i knew people who knew him and uh, I don't think I ever heard a bad thing said about him once. Um, and in fact, I, I think it's been interesting seeing, uh, you know, normally, uh, normally when someone dies, you know, there's always someone who will go, oh, well, I never liked their music anyway, or whatever. There's always some idiot that has to kind of do that and, you know, um, just inappropriately cough up that they never liked that person's creative skill um, and you know it, that's always the case especially on Facebook Twitter social media in general that's that's what you see uh, but I have noticed with Andrew Weatherall nobody's done that nobody's said oh well I never liked Screamer Delica or whatever you know uh, which I think is that the, the sings volumes basically is what I'm trying to say and that shows just how how influential and positive uh, his departure has been. Uh, so, yeah, that's all I can say about that, really. Uh, as for my favourite body work, actually, you know what? Uh, I, as much as I've just mentioned Screamer Delica and it was a huge influence, uh, I actually remember 1997 listening to BBC Radio 1 live at Tribal Gathering, Luton Who and Two Lone Swordsmen playing live and me going, wow, this is what I want to do when I grow up. Um, and I loved the idea of that live act type thing. And it's as much as I've never got there, that's always what I've strived for. So, uh, yeah, that's that. Uh, moving on, Gold Toast. Uh, hey Dom, skill and downforce. High five and high five. Uh, tips on how to achieve a full and wide mix. Uh, it's probably been asked before, but it's always a hot subject. 
I think it probably has been asked before, but you're right. <laughs> it is always a hot subject. Uh, a full and wide mix. I th I've mentioned before... <sighs> When you're looking at a mix down, I, it's a really difficult thing to put into words. I should try and maybe write it down someday. But the way I view a, a piece of music, or a, a track, I should say, a piece of music makes it sound subjective. But objectively looking at a track, um, you know, we're looking at four or maybe five different dimensions here because we're we're looking at frequency spectrum across the board. So our you know human hearing is twenty hertz to twenty thousand hertz, there or thereabouts, uh, and we're looking at amplitude. Let's call it full scale dB, so minus whatever to zero dB. And we're kind of looking at that across time as well. So we've got that fourth dimension. It is a, a, a four-dimensional zone. But then we've also got then the, the what I'm going to call the fifth dimension, which is the width, the stereo balance as well. And it's all about finding the central sort of feeling to all of that. So you need to be listening to not only is each frequency filling nicely it doesn't need to be full but is it is it full bodied um are there enough frequencies together to to warrant it being full bodied um but also is the balance right if you think of um a a, a speaker um you know a, 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 an audio monitor speaker if you think of it, it has whatever it is. Let's let's say it's a three hundred watt speaker. It has you know up to three hundred watts of of electrical energy that it can use at any moment in time. Uh, of that three hundred watts, if you're using you know two hundred and fifty of those watts just purely on the kick drum and bass line, then you you're really only leaving that fifty watts, that little bit of space for everything else up top so if you're just shoving every frequency at full amplitude all the way through you know clearly that speaker is going to struggle to reproduce whatever it is so that's really where your fifth dimension is is allowing room f while one frequency band is full the other one needs to have a bit of room to play um, and I guess that's kind of the 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 way I approach a mix down is you're you're looking at those I'm gonna call them dimensions, they're not dimensions, but let's call them five or six different dimensions or factors you're looking at, and one needs to complement the other, basically. Um and yeah, it's kinda kinda difficult to explain, but that's my take on achieving a, a full and wide mix. In in terms of actual applications i don't think there is any one thing uh that that achieves that really it, it is genuinely all about balance and so focusing on things like your kick drums will have a huge difference um you know depending on how your kick drums um intertwine with your bass line and also how how high do the harmonics of your bass line go compared to how low the fundamentals of your main lead synth is there an overlap if there's an overlap then you've got to remember that your, your speaker's going to be expending an extra bit of energy in that little overlap band uh, so if you were to high pass scoop your lead synth or low pass scoop your bass line does that free up a little bit of space and if that does then it opens out a, a bit of what we consider to be a clean sound um, and it's things like that that just allow a mix to either be full or empty or whatever so uh, yeah maybe my brain isn't working properly this morning but I feel like that somewhat answers your question um, I'm kind of vague on stuff like that because like I say I, you know there is no in my view there is no single plug-in that just fixes everything because the problems themselves are quite a grey area, so it's kind of difficult to cover, really. Uh, 
yeah, I can't think of anything else to say on that. Cavalcade. Uh, on the subject of AI composition, I wonder if the market for that may one day extend to vocal driven music. I can think of examples in pop, hip hop, EDM that could have been written by AI. Maybe they were. <laughs> yeah, who knows? Uh, oh God, yeah, some of the uh, uh, the drill hip hop stuff. Um, yeah, who knows? Um, yeah, you know what? I think there probably will be a market because, you know, as much as we all, especially us musicians, we like to think we're somewhat special and unique, um, you know, a lot of the time we're actually just kind of providing a service. And, uh, you know, there are lots of musicians who write lift music or for you Americans, elevator music. Um, you know, somebody's got to write that. And I, I don't know who, I don't know how it works in, I, I've never done elevator music before, but but I imagine, and I'm, I'm sure someone's not sitting there going, oh, I'm going to write a masterpiece for an elevator today. Um, but the point is, is that it's lowest common denominator stuff. It's just, it's commercially viable stuff that's just quick and easy fix uh you know that nobody's trying to write a masterpiece for an elevator uh you're just wanting something remotely positive and if you were to be able to fill in an online form and say i want it to be positive i want it to be this tempo i want it to be this mood this genre this instrument this voice submit and then you just get given a, an ai com a composited track maybe that's a good thing i don't know you know because then it becomes royalty free and blah 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 uh so i'm sure much like the invention of the digital camera killed the photography industry i'm sure ai music composition will kill uh the musician or music industry um We'll see. We'll see what happens, I guess. Well, look, it might not be long until we find out. Uh, you know, who knows? It, it could be an AI bot running, you know, could be this Amazon Alexa that takes over this YouTube channel. Um, who knows? And I'll be with you guys watching this. Yeah. I don't know. Uh, Fire Apple Red. Brilliant. Cheers, Dom. Uh, I've been sorting out my samples this week, actually, and making drum machines in Bitwig. There we go. Perfect. Uh, I think, was it you that mentioned last week about drum buses uh i think that was the question but either way good i like drum machines in bitwig um yeah that's how i do it myself uh francesca di carlo uh bravo uh thanks tom always inspiring i have an annoying question about lfo uh, i appreciated a lot of uh, a lot for example your tip to make that funky hi-hat controlled by an LFO. Uh, in your most recent productions, what do you use the LFOs most frequently slash mainly for? Are you experimenting with new solutions or ways to control synth slash effect parameters? Um, I, I think it's 50-50 if I'm honest. I, Usually with an LFO, I, I've all, whenever I'm using an LFO, I usually already have an idea of what I want in my head. I know the movement I want something to do. So, for example, with the hi-hats, uh, for anyone who's unaware, I, th I think I did uh, like uh, 16th note hi-hats using white noise and high-pass filtered um which were basically just little dashes of white noise. Uh, however, I then assigned an LFO to uh, the decay and release time of that, so it would fluctuate, um, but it would be random. And then I assigned an LFO to that LFO that was a reverse saw opening over four bars and that was controlling the amount of the 
other LFO. So basically it meant that towards the end of four bars, the likelihood of the decay release time being extended would become more probable. So it was kind of a, a, a mathematical sort of probability triangle. Um, in the, well, that's how it was in my head. So it just meant that maybe every four bars at the end of a rotation, the hi-hats would open um, and extend. And then, but if it was going to happen, it would only happen at the end of a four bar rotation. Uh, and yeah, so that that's basically how I sort of looked at it. And I kind of knew that that's what I wanted in my head. I, and I knew already before I'd even loaded an LFO, I was thinking to myself, that's what I want is kind of a, a random opening. Um, and I think that's probably the case most of the time, if I'm honest, it's, it's, but sometimes I will just go, I wonder what happens if I do X, Y, and Z. Um, so yeah, I think more recently they're a bit more experimental, uh, because I kind of enjoy the experimenting. Uh, hopefully that helps i don't know if that answers your question i i think if i've understood the question right then uh yeah uh ps agree alfa romeo makes very good cars thank you i'm glad there's lots of alfa romeo fans here uh it's kind of strange because everybody in the world seems to be a bmw fan and i always think that bmw's being the the prime example of just a boring car uh they make great cars but they're boring to look at or certainly the any BMW in the last 15 years, I think, in my view, they just look like, if you look at the M3, M4, M5, uh, they just look like a 3 Series, 4 Series, 5 Series. They don't look different or special. Uh, they all look like each other, just a slightly different, a slightly bigger version. Um, okay, you might have slightly different grills and maybe a bit of skirting, but... They just look like a BMW and every BMW in the last 15, 20 years looks exactly the same. And I don't, I don't understand it, you know. Um, so, uh, yeah, but I, uh, to my understanding, Alfa Romeo has kind of uh, always been the underdog. And uh, I know that they've had their problems having driven Alfa and Fiat my entire life. But, uh, yeah. Uh, it's good to see so many Alpha fans. Uh, maybe the debate about copyright deals and agreements with labels and distributors and how to get them is a bit boring, but really useful and crucial. <clears throat> For example, Dom, uh, how do you copyright your compositions? Or, beg your pardon, I guess it depends on the single deal with the label, but how does it happen to work with different labels simultaneously? Does that happen to you? Uh, so... Really, I mean, in the UK, we're very lucky that we actually don't need to copyright anything um, because the law in the UK w was, and to my understanding still is, if you've written something, that's yours. It's your copyright. That's your, it's your property. It's your intellectual property, and that's that. There's no, nobody's able to take that away from you. Uh, so long as you can prove that you did it and when we're talking about music productions let's be honest that's pretty easy to prove um because i have the bitwig project here right here or whatever um so in terms of just general copyright that's that but uh so deals and agreements with labels distributors how to get them uh i mean how to get them you literally just approach them i hate to be to make it sound too easy but it, it, it is that simple in theory um yeah um I, you know i think a lot of these people want some sort of a track record so i've got to be honest it, it's probably easier now than it was for me 20 years ago um but getting a deal with a distributor for example i've i've um spoken to a few distributors recently and um each one of them got back to me pretty much straight away so i've not i've not had any problems there and and each one of them's offered me a distribution deal so um i don't know how normal that is but it it felt fairly natural i don't think i gave much information <laughs> over so uh, it shouldn't be difficult but if you have specific questions by all means you know i'm happy to to answer those questions because 
um, I do always think there's a lot that um, there's a lot of information out there that may or may not be relevant today um, and especially when it comes to things like copyright and stuff like that so yeah it's, it is worth talking about so by all means anyone watching this who's got questions on stuff like that I can't always answer because I'm not the most knowledgeable person in the world but um, yeah I mean generally a label will sign one track from you as a single and they then take the copyright of that uh, and you just leave the rest to them well that's how it should be anyway um, but you know it, it all depends you can negotiate you know you scratch my back I'll scratch yours type scenarios um, yeah I can see the camera's about to hit 30 minutes so I'm just going to reset uh, as we hit the next question and I'm back. Uh, tech like music. Hey there, Dom. Uh, hope you're doing well. I am, thank you. Uh, talking about skill, uh, high five. Uh, you've been showing your teaching skills once again with your course for Sonic Academy on remixing Dead Mouse Caritas. Uh, watched it this weekend and really enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a question towards learning and being able to simplify the music production process next to gaining knowledge. Sorry, it's a small paragraph, but I think it all falls down to one question. How do you manage to keep your production techniques to the essential and narrow? No. How do you manage to keep your production techniques to the essential and narrow the tools you are using? Uh, the more I'm learning about audio and music production, the more pain it's bringing to me. But at the same time, I feel the need to always grasp more knowledge. Knowing that you have a degree in audio engineering, have you been facing that controversial feeling about learning? Uh, when it comes to keeping things simple in productions and sticking to it, uh, was it just something that uh, you've always been doing by habit and nature, or did you have to refrain yourself from overcomplicating the all production process and picture? Uh, and did it come more from experience and getting self confidence than just not bothering with too much knowledge? It's a good question. <laughs> it's a difficult one to answer. Look, I love, you know, I think anyone who watches this channel knows I love learning. I love information. Um, I, I, I'm pretty much a self-confessed nerd. Um, so the learning and knowledge aspect of music production just kind of came naturally just because I loved it. It, it you know, if you find a subject you love, you're never going to learn a thing in your life because it never feels like learning. You just absorb information. Um, so I think that's that's probably quite important for me to point out that I, I never felt like I was really studying, even doing my engineering degree. Um, I mean, there were some courses that, or modules in that 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 would honestly hurt my brain. Um, but even still, like I never really considered it learning. It was more just understanding, and I guess that's something. So that that psychologically when you're learning something um or at least for me anyway i don't consider it to be learning or memorizing or anything it's understanding i just need to understand how something works or why something works or why something doesn't work um and that's kind of the important bit for me once i've understood it it tends to just get remembered anyway um and i have the world's worst memory um I mean, you know, I, I forget questions on these AMAs. I forget what the hell I'm talking about midway through a, an answer. Um, you know, I genuinely have a terrible memory and, and all of my uh, best friends can vouch for that. Uh, but when it comes to music production, it, it, I kind of absorb that information differently because it's about it's about understanding how something works. So in terms of applying that to music production it's about understanding how to achieve a particular sound or shape or whatever it is you're trying to do uh so i i don't think i over complicate things if anything i probably under complicate or oversimplify my production processes sometimes uh, you'll notice some of my tracks you know they only have eight nine channels of sound in there they're not they're not difficult um and sometimes I kind of listen to my tracks and I think oh, I should I should really layer in more instruments and more of this and more of that. And then I think, but then again, why why should I? I, I like it as it is. So I don't know. Um, 
In terms of the actual question, how do you manage to keep your production techniques to the essential and narrow the tools you're using? I think it's just a case of whatever gets the job done. And I think understanding the tools makes a huge difference. Um, I think understanding uh, synthesis techniques and methods helps as well. If, for example, I hear, you know, the classic uh, wood knock bass sound, and you know that, like, it's hard to explain, but for me, I can almost taste different sounds. And I know that sounds really silly, but it's a very weird thing that for me, there's a texture to certain sounds. So like that wood knock bass, um, the, the classic sort of deep house bass line type, almost a funky edge to it. Um, to me, there's that sort of uh, fluffy, noisy texture to it that tells me that's FM synthesis um, that achieved that. So, so knowing maybe how many oscillators or whatever are kind of at play in there, uh, it it kind of helps. So understanding the tools allows you to then go, oh, okay, I need this to make this sound or whatever. And it, uh, yeah, I, I feel that feels very weird saying all that out loud, but. I, yeah, I don't know. It's uh, I think maybe we're now now I'm saying it out loud. Maybe we're now establishing that maybe it comes to me as second nature and maybe I've never really thought about it. Um, and therefore, maybe I'm just very, very lucky that it just happens. Yeah, maybe I'm just lucky. I don't know. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I I wish I could give you more of a, a clear answer to that, but I, I'm not sure if I can. Uh, but feel free to ask more specific questions. Uh, Jockemeyer, skill, high five. Thanks for mentioning an alternative to UA's Pultec plugin. I've been using Wave's version of the Pultec. Oh, do they have one? Uh, and I've been wanting an alternative so I don't have to keep buying the upgrade plan when I update computers. Bane of my life. Question, uh, can you recommend an alternative to the L1 or L2, or does Waves have something special that no one can recreate? I only use it like you do in the master chain to bring the signal back up to zero dB. Thanks. Do you know what? I've not really looked because I, and I'm, I, I don't know why I use the L1 for that. Um, yeah, I really, I don't know why I stick with that. I could probably use almost anything. I think when I, I mean, we're going back a long time when I first started using the L1. Basically, for anyone watching this that doesn't know what I'm talking about, uh, when I'm doing a mix down and I just want to raise the master because all my channels sort of peak at minus 10 dB. So I just want to stick something on the master to just raise the gains of of the master uh, just to get it closer to zero db um i could use a gain tool but then there's a there's a chance that things might just clip over zero db so what i'll tend to do is just bring down the threshold and set i'll set the ceiling of the the limiter to be zero db and i'll bring the threshold down just until i might get a, a touch of gain reduction you know we're talking one maybe two db um but the l1 was always quite a transparent compressor it just never really left any marks um i think at the very beginning the l1 was one of the first uh compressors that was able to have a 24 bit um look ahead on it and i think that's probably one of the reasons but in all honesty, I could probably use a multitude of different synths for that now. In fact, I'd probably say either the Ozone Limiter or uh, New Gen Audio do uh, the... What's it called? The True Peak Limiter. They've only got one True Peak Limiter uh, and it's currently on version 2. Whatever that is, New Gen Audio. Uh, it's just completely slipped my head now. I, I, I want to say LMS2 or LP something 2. 
something like that. Um, but yeah, that I highly recommend. It's a super transparent synth. It's a true peak limiter. Um, I could probably use one of them instead of the L1 these days. Um, and it would probably be far more transparent. So, uh, yeah, I'd probably, if you, if you're, if you're looking to get away from waves, uh, which I completely understand because I think the update plans are very odd. Um, as you say, it's just every time you get a new computer, you suddenly have to spank $200 on getting the exact same plugins that you already had. Um, but yeah, so if you're looking to get away from waves, I would say... That, that new gen audio uh, True Peak Limiter, TPL2, True Peak Limiter. It'll come to me just after I stop recording this. Um, but yeah, I highly recommend their, their limiter. If you don't have it anyway, then I highly recommend that for, for any sort of master chain. Uh, yeah, so there we go. Not your human. Love your videos, Dom. Any progress on the new studio? Oh, I mentioned that earlier on. So I'm, I'm there's no progress really, um, but the vast majority of reasons for that is down to financial reasons um, in that uh, it costs a lot and I don't have none um, yeah so I'm aiming and hoping that it'll be in or around this summer so we're getting closer uh, have you got your eye on more hardware? I know at some point you said you were going to buy an ultra wide monitor, but it looks like after buying the Mac, you might not get it. Yeah, I was interested in the ultra wide monitor. Um, but, you know, as you say, with the with the iMac, I don't, I don't need a new monitor. In fact, the monitor on this iMac is beautiful. Uh, and I think I've said that before as well. I hadn't I hadn't factored that in when buying it. It hadn't considered it, to be honest. Um, by the way, saw one of your old videos, uh, Late Night Studio Lols from 2011. I can't stop laughing. What happened to that channel? Uh, so that was my previous channel. So... I'll be as quick as I can here because it's probably really boring information but essentially I had the Dom Kane channel which I just used as any YouTuber did I just random uploads every now and then uh, there was no it wasn't really considered a social media back then we're talking you know 2007 2008 um, and yeah, so I did upload a couple of LOL sessions and whatever. Uh, I know the one you're talking about, actually. <laughs> it was a funny session. Um, but um, then when I set up uh, Kane Audio as a legit studio that I kind of wanted to separate from Dom Kane, so that Dom Kane was the musician artist releasing on record labels, and then Kane Audio was the the sound design and music production studio so i kind of wanted to separate them both so i did that on youtube and set up kane audio and then this kane audio channel was kind of set up to push the kane audio side of stuff and then obviously doing these amas it's kind of just become an all-in-one me thing which is why I then changed the name to Dom Kane slash Kane Audio or whatever it is uh, so now I have like 18 YouTube channels <laughs> but yeah this is basically the only one I actually publish stuff on uh, so there we go that's what happened to that channel um, Mano Sling uh, hey Dom I've been producing music for four years now and a couple of months ago I got in touch with an artist because he liked my work an artist I actually listen to in my free time. Cool. Uh, that day felt really special to me, uh, but it has also put pressure on me as an artist. I feel like any time I'm not making music, I'm wasting my time. And right now, when I'm making music, I just constantly screw up everything, mostly mixing and mastering. It's like I'm developing backwards. I know that feeling. We all go through that. Do not worry. It passes eventually. It does pass, I promise. Um... Most of that is usually because we want to be more developed than we actually are. And sometimes you need to just take a step back and take things in your stride. And that goes for also, you said, uh, when you're not producing music, you feel like you're wasting time. I can assure you it's not a waste of time. Um, because the last thing you want to do is burn out and then never come back. Um, 
that's not an ideal situation. So I think personally it's very important. And in fact, uh, I can say from my professional standpoint, I, I honestly think it's very important to take a step back sometimes and just go, you know what, I'm not feeling creative this afternoon. Rather than trying to force myself and stress myself out, maybe I'd be better off just watching a movie or just re take the afternoon off, do something you enjoy, go for a walk, go for a swim, whatever it is you you enjoy in life, do that. Um, and I think that ties in with the whole mental health thing as well. You know, it, it's kind of pointless. And I've said in various ways before you know you can't you can't choose when to be creative you can't you can't force yourself to be creative and I've gone through periods uh where I've not written a, a track for myself for months in fact I went for one period and I've talked about this before in previous videos where I went was it nearly two years I think without even writing a single track for myself Admittedly, I, I wrote tracks for other artists and I wrote for for Kane Audio. I did sound design projects. I did, you know, I, st I was still working in the music industry. I just wasn't releasing anything under my own name and I wasn't interested in signing anything to any record labels. I had no interest in writing music for myself. It just, you know, and like I say, it was, I think it was nearly two years Um and yeah, I think, you know, these things happen. Um, and I think at the end of the day, you you've got to remember why you got into this in the first place. And I think for 99% of us, I hope 99% of us, we got into this music industry because we love music and because we, we, we want to be a part of that industry. And um, if you're not enjoying it, then there's no point being in the music industry so you you've got to be able to just take a step back and go you know what today's not my day i'll come back tomorrow or whatever uh so there we go uh i also feel especially pressured uh, since i'm oh, you're 16 man come on <laughs> chill out relax uh I'm 16 years old currently and through the years I've started to develop this mentality that I have to be uh, one of these young prodigies that just put out masterpiece after masterpiece. I can tell you right now, you do not need to be one of those. Um, and in fact, I, I don't want to be the one saying this, but I feel like I need to maybe be the one saying this a lot, not all, but a lot of those young prodigies you see uh, have had management and planning and PR teams and money and investment and backing and there's a lot more behind the scenes than it all than it first seems and as much as I hate to say that because it's a horrible truth it doesn't mean it's not the truth um, it's just an unfortunate part of this industry that that we are led to believe sometimes that that people are able to create masterpiece after masterpiece and that's not always the case uh there are some very well-known producers out there who appear to create masterpiece after masterpiece when in fact they don't actually 100 percent write all of the those tracks and there are lots and lots of very well-known artists who you would never believe that to be the case um obviously i'm not going to name names but there are lots out there um and don't get me wrong lots of it is perfectly legitimate as well i'm not talking about ghost production or anything like that i'm talking about collaborative stuff but the the collaborator doesn't quite get a mention or whatever there's a lot of stuff like that that goes on so honestly it, never expect to write masterpiece after masterpiece because i don't think it happens for for anyone apart from maybe mozart or beethoven or you know actual prodigies um so yeah um it's definitely not a, a healthy mindset to have but what i will say and this is a far more positive thing is that i also know in fact i know far more as as many as many famous DJs and producers that I know who earn crazy amounts of money and whatever, I know 
10 times more DJs and producers who, if I were to name them on this YouTube channel right now, I doubt any of you will have heard of them. But they're out almost every weekend DJing, playing gigs that they love, uh, they're paying their bills, they're feeding their family, uh, they're putting out productions on labels that are good quality, they are working constantly. And they're playing the game, they're hustling, you know, and there's a lot of DJs and producers out there who just get their head down, they work hard, they get the gigs, they get the, the label releases, they earn some money and they do good. Um, you know, I can assure you there are thousands out there that you haven't heard of and you might never hear of, but they're happy and they're working and they're earning money and they're doing good things and there being a positive influence around them and it's there, it's there. So really that's the more realistic goal I think. Forget the whole uh, wanting to be a superstar, prodigy, mega rich and famous, whatever, because that's for the very, very, very few. Um, and there's usually a lot of politics involved as well. Whereas for every one of those up there, there are hundreds of people below who are just perfectly happy carrying on. I mean, I'm one, to be honest, you know, I'm not super famous. I'm certainly not super rich, um, but I can feed my family and have a roof over my head and enjoy a good, healthy life uh, with a room full of equipment I get to nerd out over on a regular basis. Uh, so, you know, Generally speaking, I couldn't be happier, the, you know, other than being super rich, which I don't think would make me that much happier, if I'm honest. Uh, so, uh, where did I get to? It's a really unhealthy mentality that I just can't seem to brush aside, no matter how hard I try. Producing music became uh, riddled with anxiety and low self-esteem for me, uh, but I don't want to quit making it uh, since I don't want to lose these four years of momentum I've gained, and also because it's something I've gotten very emotionally attached to. Uh, and also sorry for turning this show into a therapy session, but I'm hoping that someone else will be able to relate. I guarantee you people watching this will be able to relate. Um, and you know what? You, you've got that four years of momentum. Don't look at it as momentum. It's not momentum. Don't worry about it. You, you don't lose it. Any skill you pick up in music production doesn't get lost. It might get forgotten until you go, oh yeah, there's that. And that's that. But it is, it's honestly, it's like riding a bike. Uh, you know, once you've once you've nailed it, you're not you're not really going to lose that. Um, so I honestly I, I, I think, you know, take a break. If you're not feeling if you're if you're stressing yourself out, then uh, I honestly think just take a break. Watch a movie, get find something that inspires you. Um, you know, I've always said before on this channel, one of the things I do is I watch sci fi films when I'm not feeling creative. I watch sci fi films but for me. I love sci-fi film score, so watching a film like Interstellar or something with, with a Hans Zimmer score just makes me go, oh, I love this music. And, that, and that's what got me into it in the first place, you know. Um, and it, it reminds me of what, what's out there. Um, and often I will watch a sci-fi film and I'll hear maybe a little sound or something. Um you know, like the, the famous sound, if you've watched the Netflix film um, Annihilation, uh, the, the sound at the end of that, anyone who's watched it, you know exactly what I'm talking about. That sound, man, that sound. I remember hearing that or watching it for the first time and going, jeez, that sound. And, and then I had to pause it and I had to jump onto the computer and just try and do something with it and whatever. And I had to play. Um you know, that's what sci-fi films do to me at times. I'll just hear a sound and it just makes me... I, I have to go and write because I'm inspired to, to do something that has a similar sound or a similar effect or a similar chord pattern or whatever it is that inspired me. Um, and I get really excited. And, and, you know, I think that's the reason we all got into writing music in the first place. That excitement, it was that... Whatever it was, There's there's that burning passion deep down somewhere and we all have that and I think it's in this day and age especially with social media where everything has to be on fucking Instagram and all super good looking and all the bullshit that is in our industry I think sometimes it's 
difficult to remember that little burning flame of passion of of what it was that got us into the music industry in the first place um so if you're not feeling that find it that's the most important thing if you want to be a good producer you've got to you've got to work with that that burning passion if you're not working with that burning passion then who are you working for it's not yourself so uh my biggest advice is take a break it doesn't matter whether it's an hour a day a week a month whatever it is to find that thing that makes you go i have to get in the studio i'm desperate i want to write xyz insert song here uh so yeah hopefully that helps i think we can all relate though um 100 keep at it man you, you're 16 i can't i can't even begin look i still feel like i'm just getting started i'm 38 and i still every day i think ah oh, you know just around this corner i've got this project and oh it's oh it's just getting started i've been saying it's just getting started for like 20 years and i still feel good about it i still feel like there's so much more to come and in a good way not oh i haven't achieved anything i feel like i've achieved loads in my life but i still feel i've got so much more to go um i wish i could tell 16 year old me that um because i definitely remember getting frustrated at age 16 and and thinking why am i not there yet i want to be there um and 18 year old me and 21 year old me <laughs> so uh yeah just keep at it you can do it you can do it and yeah so that was the end of your comment moving on ricky john skill high five have a great weekend you too uh fire apple red skill high five saint nicholas brilliant skill high five uh that is it my friends we're coming up to ooh, nearly an hour so if you have made it this far then honestly you deserve a medal because uh this has been a long one and i feel like i've really ranted about some boring things today so i apologize for that uh yeah although chances are the people who got bored have left already and they're not hearing my apology how about that um so to prove that you have made it this far into the video comment the word groove because a recommended video here is tech house mix 2018 summer groove camel fat carl cox dot 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 so comment the word groove and I'll give you a high five in next week's video. Please do keep the questions coming. Uh, yeah, we're on like episode 92 now, are we, of these AMAs? Something like that. We're getting there. We are getting there. Well, so that's two months until episode 100. Um, yeah, wouldn't it be nice if I could launch that in the new studio? It's not going to happen. Uh, right yeah so please do keep them coming um patreon subscribers a massive thank you i think we're almost getting to the point where i'm going to start buying equipment for the hackintosh uh something i haven't said and this is for only for the loyal viewers of this who uh, make it to the ends of these videos i guess i'm also going to probably give away the hackintosh that i build on the patreon channel uh so if that interests you then get involved uh, it's not going to be the world's fastest computer don't get too excited but uh it should hopefully be a fully working hackintosh uh so stay tuned and i'll talk more about that when it's actually happening um so yeah thank you very much to everyone for watching and i'll see you this time next week cheers